A nation that knows not its past has neither a present nor a future. And so, in 1968, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan commissioned the Center for Documentation and Research to embark on a progressive and innovative mission. For over 500 years, the Arabian Peninsula has attracted the attention of European and other neighboring powers. As a result, much of the recorded history of the region has accumulated in different countries around the world. Since its inception, the CDR has reached out to various international archives in order to bring back a massive and expanding collection of historical documents, manuscripts, maps, and audiovisual materials. These records contain a wealth of historical information that shed valuable light on the political, social, economic, and other aspects of the Arab Islamic heritage. All coming here to the CDR. An immense national asset and an exciting international sanctuary for researchers, students, and other seekers of knowledge. Indeed, through the insights provided by these archives, our nation gains valuable lessons that facilitate our quest toward progress and prosperity. The lessons that archives provide can also elicit a sense of ownership, pride, and patriotic values for our youth, as these records are the memories and historical register of our nation. Since it was established in 1968, the CDR has risen to become the ranking archival repository in the region. It takes the lead in collection, documenting, translating, and preserving invaluable historical source materials. It not only collects, but it also publishes, turning disparate documents into meaningful literature. The 21st century world is being linked and even unified through information technology. So, one of the key missions for the CDR in this new century is not simply to expand our archive, but also to explore it in new ways. And so, with the archive as our resource, we can all become adventurers and explorers, sailing the oceans of time on voyages of discovery into our past, helping us understand our present, and with the lessons learned, shedding light into our common future. The region of the UAE has been inhabited since the late Stone Age, as clearly evidenced by fine flint tools found in Merawa, belonging to skilled herders and the earliest fishing settlement houses found in Dalma. During the close of the 4th millennium BC, locally known as the Jebel Hafid period, the earliest above-ground tombs were found in Jebel Hafid and Jebel Alimala. The period coincided with the emergence of the local copper industry and an agricultural settlement in Al Ain. The area known as the Umm al Nar period was made possible by the domestication of the date palm, giving rise to oasis towns such as Kalba, Tel Abraq, Bidya, and Hili. The Wadi Souk and Late Bronze Age showed a growing sophistication in the creation of both weapons and decorative artifacts. During what is known as the Iron Age, the domestication of the camel totally changed the Arabian way of life and trade. Even trade by water had its early beginnings in this era, giving rise to written language in order to keep records. By the late 15th century, when Vasco da Gama had circumnavigated the Cape of Good Hope and the Portuguese had come into the region, the Arabian Peninsula and the Arabian Gulf was inhabited by a number of peoples. The Hormuz Kingdom across the Straits to the north. The Omani Arabs on the east side of the peninsula with Muscat as their center. The Kawasim who settled up the tip of the peninsula near Ras al-Khaimah. 
the Wahhabis who came up from the West to spread their form of the Islam, and of course the Beni As, one of the principal tribal groupings of the Arabian Gulf, whose presence in the desert region of Al Dafra and the Liwa Oasis was known since very early times and who would eventually inhabit Abu Dhabi. The story of Abu Dhabi and the Al-Bufala rulers begins around 1761 and is credited to the Beniyas chief Sheikh Diab bin Isa. Some say that during a hunt in the arid and desolate coastal region, the Sheikh trailed an elusive gazelle over a narrow sandbar which ran out to the island during low tide. And where the gazelle had stood, he found a precious spring of fresh water, thus establishing Abu Dhabi, which means father of the gazelle. No matter how it happened, the discovery of fresh water opened the way to settlement. The island offered a great strategic location, protected on all sides from easy attack, as well as providing harbor access to fisheries and thriving pearl beds from which to establish an economy. Thirty years later, after serving as a growing outpost for the Liwa Bay Sheikh Diab, a conflict over control of Abu Dhabi resulted in the Sheikh's death. Abu Dhabi Island thereafter became the permanent capital of the Al Bufala clan, the ruling dynasty of the Baniyas tribal confederation, and the ancestors of the present Al Nahyan ruling family of Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi thrived under Sheikh Shakabut bin Diab, as shown in this document from J.S. Buckingham. Abu Dhabi is a place of some trade, being in friendship with the Imam of Muscat. Its port was receiving vessels and supplies of both merchandise and provisions from that mart. These years also marked the establishment of a fortification on Abu Dhabi, which was to become the Al Bufala ruler's seat of power for the next 200 years, and famously known as the Qasr al Hissan in subsequent times. By 1818, the British government had taken control of the East India Company and put its full military might behind protecting her valuable imperial interests in India. The Arabian Peninsula proved a constant challenge to them as various factions of coastal Arabs and particularly the Khawasim under the leadership of Sheikh Sultan bin Sakar attacked British trading vessels. Britain's efforts to control all maritime activities caused them to brand all maritime conflicts as piracy. This led to the General Treaty of 1820, in which Abu Dhabi's Sheikh Shakabut agreed to be responsible for controlling maritime aggressions along the coast from Dubai westwards to Qatar. The era from 1818 until 1845 covering the reigns of Sheikhs Tanun and Khalifa bin Shakabut, witnessed the emergence of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi as a powerful political, economic, and military force on the Gulf Coast. The ten-year reign of Sheikh Said bin Tanun was marked by the struggle for supremacy on the Gulf Coast between the Qasimi Sheikh Sultan bin Sakar and Sheikh Maktoum of Dubai who coveted the support of the young and powerful Sheikh of Abu Dhabi. Sheikh Said's succession as leader of Abu Dhabi came about through the combined support of Sheikh Maktoum of Dubai and the British. Bred in the tradition of his illustrious predecessors, Sheikh Said bin Tanun emerged as the predominant power on land by virtue of his military might and statesmanship. He was held in high regard by the British government and contemporary maritime chiefs, and all the tribes of Oman submitted to his authority. With a succession of leadership by Sheikh Zayed bin Khalifa, Sheikh Said's cousin, a long 54-year period of stability and consolidation came to the region. By virtue of his personality and leadership qualities, Sheikh Zayed became a legendary figure on the Gulf Coast. By the time Sheikh Zayed returned from his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1880, Abu Dhabi had become the most influential and powerful of the Trucial states, while Dubai emerged as the center of commerce. 
By the early 20th century, he had extended his control inland to the Dawahira Burami at Alain and had successfully withstood the Turkish and Wahhabi attempts to control Odeid and Oman. These good years of growth, stability, and prosperity were unfortunately to come to an end with Sheikh Zayed's death in 1909. Following the two successive reigns of Sheikhs Tanun and Hamdan bin Zayed from 1909 to 1912, and 1912 to 1922 respectively, Abu Dhabi witnessed a brief period of political turmoil marked by quick successions of Sheikh Sultan bin Zayed, 1922 to 1926, and Sheikh Sakar bin Zayed, 1926 to 1928. The situation, however, was quickly brought under control with the accession of Sheikh Shakabut bin Sultan as the ruler in 1928. By now, major innovations in transportation and communications had developed a global economy, which unfortunately, in 1929, crashed into the Great Depression. The ensuing worldwide depression combined with the Japanese development of cheaper cultured pearls threw the Trucial states into very hard times. The prospect for exporting oil from the region provided great hope for relief. But it was not to happen right away. The Second World War would intervene. Although the coastal Arab states generally managed to stay out of the fray of the war, the region's isolation was quickly coming to an end, and the old ways would soon be challenged. For example, the granting of oil concessions meant that a new concept of borders needed to be established in a land without rivers, where previously influence, not physical borders, ruled. Sheikh Shakabut stood against this storm of change and pitted the values of tradition against rapid development. Although this seems like a very enlightened attitude in context of today's modern world, it caused much confusion and frustration at the time. It seemed inconceivable that pursuit of wealth was not reason enough to abandon the core values of tradition, but not to Sheikh Shakabut. Ultimately, the pressures for modernization overcame his resistance, and in 1966, Sheikh Shakabut abdicated his rule to his trusted brother, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan. It was up to Sheikh Zayed to manage the transformation and modernization of Abu Dhabi, and to lead in the creation of the United Arab Emirates that we know today. As the ruler of Abu Dhabi since 1966, and the president of the UAE since 1971 until his demise in November 2004, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan, ably supported by the rulers of the other emirates, deserves credit for the rapid and phenomenal development of the UAE, which in terms of speed and magnitude remains unparalleled. Soon after assuming power on August 6th, Sheikh Zayed underscored the importance of union and began to devote a large part of his emirate's income from oil to the Trucial State's Development Fund, long before the inception of the UAE as a federal state. The move towards establishing a federation was further accelerated by the British government announcement in 1968 of its intention to withdraw from the Gulf by the end of 1971. This sudden decision prompted the move towards establishing a federation with the other Trucial state rulers, the foundation of which was formally proclaimed on 2nd December 1971, and Sheikh Zayed was elected by his fellow rulers as the first president of the UAE, a post to which he was successfully re-elected at five-year intervals. Sheikh Zayed's stature grew internationally, and he emerged as the mentor and mediator for the younger statesmen not only in the GCC, but also within the Arab world and for many a developing country. Furthermore, his humanitarian approach derived from his firm faith in the Islam resulted in a host of poor countries and communities worldwide benefiting from the spectacular generosity of this great man. On the celebration of 25 years of success of the Federation, Sheikh Zayed remarked, That which has been accomplished has exceeded all our expectations, and that, with the help of God and a sincere will, confirms that there is nothing that cannot be achieved in the service of the people if determination is firm and intentions are sincere. 
It is to the credit of this great leader that the UAE Federation is, and will continue to be, a source of immense pride for the present and future generations as the architect of modern UAE and the father of the nation. Sheikh Zayed's ideals and achievements are being ably carried on by his sons, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed, the president of the UAE, and Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, deputy commander of the UAE Armed Forces and the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. The story of the Al Bufala rulers is only one of many treasures to be found in our CDR archives. Stories that have been written but have yet to be told, giving us a growing understanding of how we came to be here in a thriving modern metropolis in what were once considered to be one of the harshest lands on earth. We reach out from the lessons of the past to the promise and vision of our youth, providing them with a resource that will serve them as they venture into a future of opportunity, growth, peace, prosperity, and that most precious of all resources, wonder.